and welcome everyone and welcome also to Ron. Thank you for, yeah, I mean like we are very grateful that we can have you here talking uh, to us about Christianity and politics and for everyone here, yeah, welcome to Ivy Grad and also welcome to yeah, GFM. I will pass the stage to Prescott to introduce Ron and explain about our session today. Yeah, thanks, Evan. Um, thanks all for joining today. Okay, so now allow me to introduce formally our speaker. Um, Dr. Ron Sider is a distinguished professor emeritus of theology, holistic ministry, and public policy at Palmer Theological Seminary at Eastern University, which is actually about 20 minutes from where I grew up. Um, and he's also president emeritus of a group known as Christians for Social Action, uh, formerly known as Evangelicals for Social Action. Um, in his years of experience, Ron has spoken in six continents and has published more than 40 books. Uh, one of his books, called Rich Christian, Christians in an Age of Hunger, was recognized as one of the top 100 most influential religious books of the 20th century. Um, he's a contributing editor for Christianity Today and Sojourners, and continues to give lectures all over the world. So uh, he might yet get that seventh, that elusive seventh continent. Um, but yeah, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Ron Sider. Thank you, um, friends. It's a delight to be with you. You know, uh, InterVarsity um, uh, is my home, has been uh, for a very long time. Uh, way back in uh, 1957, I met um, a lovely young woman um, in an InterVarsity prayer meeting uh, in grade 13, the last year of high school. InterVarsity in Canada at the time uh, had um, ministry in the high schools and uh, we got to know each other. We've been married now for um, 59 years uh, and um, all through um, the um, graduate school days, six, six years in New Haven, InterVarsity was my home, our home. Then uh, as it was mentioned, um, InterVarsity uh, published uh, a number of my books and, uh, and finally, uh, some of you I'm sure know uh, Nikki Toyama Zeto. Uh, she is a Stanford grad and then uh, became an university staffer uh, out in uh, your area and then uh, headed up Urbana. And uh, she, she's now the absolutely wonderful um, executive director of uh, Christians for Social Action. So I work with her all the time. So um, InterVarsity is my family and I'm just delighted to be with you tonight. I want to do basically two things. First of all, I, um, I want to um, sketch how I try to move from Christian faith to politics. Uh, the book, Just Politics, um, is my um, book long uh, effort at explaining that. I'll just um, summarize key ideas there. And then I want to talk about um, applying that to the current scene. Uh, you know, it's an amazing, utterly amazing moment to be uh, talking about politics. I talk about a triple tsunami. Uh, I think this election is the most important in 160 years since Abraham Lincoln was elected. Uh, that's one tsunami. Uh, that'd be enough. But uh, then we got um, COVID-19 and the economic collapse. And then we got um, uh, George Floyd's uh, murder and the utterly astounding response uh, that I think opens up a new possibility we're really dealing with um, racism in our society. So all of that together makes it a just incredible time to be thinking about um, Christian faith and politics. Just because you're a good Christian doesn't mean you get your politics right. Uh, just two stories to illustrate that. Uh, Jesse Helms uh, for a number of years was one of the leading pro-life senators in the US Senate. But he was also from uh, North Carolina and that's the largest tobacco growing state in the country. And he favored government subsidies for tobacco growers. He even supported sending US tobacco abroad to poor nations under our Food for Peace program. Not, I would suggest, a completely pro-life agenda. But just to illustrate, uh, take another illustration from uh, the other side. Uh, Miguel Descoto was um, Christian. I got to know him, uh, uh, a Catholic priest. He was a Nicaraguan. And after the Sandinistas took over in 1979, he became foreign minister of uh, Nicaragua. And as you know, a number of the Sandinistas, not all of them, but some of them were pretty hardcore Marxists. And Miguel Escoto accepted the Lenin Peace Prize 
in Moscow, went around the Soviet Union, I think in about 18, uh, I'm sorry, 1987, saying that the Soviet Union was the last best hope for Earth. Not entirely perceptive, you know, in 1987. So just because you're a Christian, and both of those men were, doesn't mean you get your politics right. So uh, how do we um, work at that? Well, one more comment, and that is that, you know, some people say that uh, uh, Christian, that politics is so messy, we just should leave it alone, do evangelism, build the church, and forget about it. I think that's wrong for two reasons, one pragmatic and one theological. The pragmatic point is that political decisions actually affect the lives of millions and millions, literally billions of people in the world. In the case of the American president and the American pol top political leaders, their decisions affect the lives of billions of people around the world. Think of the good that William Wilberforce did as a British politician. He was converted in the West End Revival, as you know, and then for 30 years worked to persuade his colleagues in the British Parliament to end the slave trade and, and, and slavery itself. Amazing contribution. Or in 1983, 19, uh, 1983 1933, uh, German Christians elected Hitler as chancellor. Think of the world, what the world could have been spared if they had not done that. So politics is just too important to um, ignore it. But uh, the other reason, of course, is theological. Our most basic Christian confession is that Jesus is Lord. That means he's Lord of all of life. That means he's Lord of our politics. And in a democracy, how we vote, whether we vote or whether we don't vote, we affect the outcome. So we need to be engaged with politics. But how do we do that in a way that in fact is deeply biblical. I think it's important to realize that every political decision really has four components in it. Now, most people don't think about it carefully. They probably couldn't tell you about those four components, but they're there. Uh, one is what I call a normative framework. You have to have some understanding, even if it's just implicit, about um, who persons are and what justice means and so on. And I want that normative framework to come from the Bible for me. But that's not enough. I've never been able to uh, find in the Bible uh, the science of how to deal with COVID-19 or how to deal with um, a, a planet where we have uh, about 7.6 billion people now and producing climate change. We have to study the relevant science and economics and politics. And then we need to put that together in what I call a political philosophy. Why that? Well, every time you want to make it a political decision about how you vote uh, for president or whatever, you can't spend five years going back and studying all the relevant biblical material and another five years spending all the relevant science and economics and so on. You have to have a handy roadmap, a guide. And that's what a political philosophy is. Now, I want my political philosophy to come from those two things I mentioned originally, namely a normative biblical framework, and second, a careful ongoing study of the world. And then of course, the, the last point, fourth point, is that you have to apply that uh, political philosophy to important political decisions, like how to vote this year. One other uh, kind of introductory point, and that is it seems to me it's crucial that Christians first articulate and develop their political agenda and their concrete proposals within the Christian community on the basis of biblical norms. If we don't do that, we're gonna end up adopting secular ideologies of left or right. And I think that's exactly what's happened in the Christian community in the last 40 or 50 years in the US. Too many Christians have uncritically adopted either left-wing or right-wing political assumptions. And the result I think has been a very seriously sub-Christian religious right that I believe correctly championed the family and the sanctity of human life, but neglected economic justice for the poor, uncritically endorsed American nationalism, ignored environmental concern for God's creation, and neglected to struggle against racism. I think there was an equally sub-Christian reality on the religious left. They defended justice peace and the integrity of creation, but they forgot about the importance of the family and sexual integrity. And they certainly were not defending 
the unborn. I want to go to the scriptures for my normative vision. So let me move to that, first of all, and sketch real briefly how I try to develop a normative vision. That comes for me from two places. One, what I call the biblical story, and then two, from my attempt to summarize a whole variety of things like the nature of justice, the nature of persons, and so on, from the biblical canon. But first, the biblical story. You know, the biblical story provides an essential framework, I think, for Christian political thought. The entire created order is good, precious. It comes from the hand of a loving God. Persons created in the image of God are called to a servant-like stewardship of the rest of the creator's handiwork. Now, tragically, humanity has rebelled against God. The result is selfish persons, twisted social relationships and institutions, and even a groaning, disordered creation. But God was not willing to forsake humanity. The creator began a long historical process of salvation to restore a right relationship between God and persons and the earth around us. And at the center of that redeeming grace is Jesus Christ, Nazarene carpenter, eternal word, who models perfect humanity, atones for our sins, rises from the dead to break the power of evil. And history is moving toward that risen Lord's return when all things will be restored to wholeness. Now that biblical story, true story, provides a foundation for our thinking about the nature and dignity and destiny of persons, about the status of the non-human world, about the importance of the historical process and the ultimate meaning of all things. But then the second part of my normative biblical framework comes as I try to look at the whole canon and develop a kind of summary of what the Bible tells us about a number of key things, like the nature of persons, economic justice, and so on. Let me illustrate a few of those. First, the special dignity and sanctity of every human being. Every person and only human beings are created in the image of God, called to a stewardship of the non-human creation, made to find fulfillment only when rightly related to God and neighbor and the earth and self, and were summoned to respond in freedom to God's invitation of salvation and to live forever amazing in the presence of the risen Lord. Every person, no matter how young or old, weak or strong, is inestimably precious because of what God says about us. And I think we must therefore respect the sanctity of human life from beginning to end, not just from conception to birth, but all the way through. Another aspect of my normative biblical vision, freedom of belief. Throughout biblical history, God gives persons enormous freedom to respond in obedience or rebellion, unbelief or faith in God. Now, certainly the Old Testament doesn't talk about religious freedom the way we do today, but it's true that in the Old Testament, we see God giving enormous freedom to the people of Israel to respond in obedience. They regularly disobey. He punishes them. He calls them back. It's a back and forth, a dialogue, enormous freedom there. And Jesus tells the parable of the wheat and the tares. And he says that the tares should be allowed to grow in the field, which is the world, not the church, uh, until the end of history. And a wonderful statement about religious freedom. Justice is another important part of my normative biblical framework. There are two key Hebrew words, mishpat and zidakah, and they talk about both economic justice and legal justice. Fair courts really matters um, according to God and the Bible, and so do just economic arrangements. You know, the Old Testament tells us that when the people of Israel moved into the land of Canaan, the land was divided. Every family got an ancestral inheritance. And the prophets tell us that God wanted families to continue to control that land. The book of um, uh, Leviticus 25 says that every 50 years, the land goes back to the original owners. Even if you lost your land because of irresponsibility or whatever, a sickness, you got your land back, the family got it back at the year of Jubilee. Now the prophets tell us 
that powerful kings and other um, unjust people seized more and more of the land. Poor people lost their land. They couldn't care for their families. And the prophets denounced that so severely that they said God was going to destroy the nation of Israel and Judah because of basically two things, their idolatry and their economic injustice. But the prophets also look ahead to some time in the future when uh, things are restored and they say that every person will sit under his own vine and fig tree and be undisturbed. In other words, they'll hand their land back. Now, in an agricultural society, land is the basic capital. We live in an information society. Knowledge is our basic capital. But what I think that discussion of the land in Israel tells us is that economic justice means that every person has access to the basic capital, the basic productive resources, so that if they act responsibly, they can earn their own way and be dignified members of their community. Closely connected, of course, with what the Bible tells us of justice is the fact that there are hundreds and hundreds of verses all through the Old Testament and the New that God has a special concern for the poor and God demands that his people have a special concern for the poor. Well, I could go on in the book. I talk about a number of uh, other aspects that at least illustrates how I try to look at the whole biblical canon to develop that normative biblical framework. But then I have to apply that and develop a political philosophy. And I said that I try to do that by combining my normative framework with an ongoing study of the relevant economics and politics and science and so on. Now, obviously, I'm a theologian, an ethicist, not a politician uh, or a political scientist, so I don't do that full time. Um, and uh, nobody, uh, or at least not very many people, can do that full time. But I try to do that carefully and I try to put those together. So let me illustrate how I've developed my political philosophy by trying to combine those two things. The first thing I'll mention is what I call decentralization of power. Decentralization of power. Now, I think there's a positive reason and a negative reason for decentralizing all forms of power. The positive reason is that every person is created in the image of God and God wants every person to exercise her creation mandate and become a co-worker with God in shaping history. Now, if just a tiny group of people make all the political decisions, then you and I can't exercise our creation mandate. But there's also a negative reason. The great um, British thinker long, long ago, Lord Acton, said power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. In a fallen world, sinful people will always use excessive centralized power for their own selfish advantage. We see that in the Soviet Union, where the political people also controlled the economy uh, and there was dictatorship and great injustice. We also need to think about the fact that in our own country, there is enormous uh, consolidation of economic power. You know, the richest 1% own more wealth in the US than the bottom 80%. And in the last few years, almost all of the growth in income in this country way over 90% of the growth in income has gone to the richest 1%. That's enormous concentration of power. Another aspect of my political philosophy, and it grows out of this concern to decentralize power, is that I think on balance, uh, Winston, uh, democracy is, is a good deal. Winston Churchill said that democracy is the worst of all possible political arrangements, uh, except for all the others. Uh, and that's, I think, one way of, of putting it. Democracy, democracy uh, results from a concern for human rights, concern for individual freedom, and a concern to decentralize power. If you really have freedom of speech, secret voting, universal suffrage, then in principle, you've got a major decentralization of power. And when you separate legislative and, um, and um, administrative and judicial decisions, you decentralize power. I think another way we decentralize power that's crucial in this nation is all of the non-governmental institutions. Between individuals and the state, there are a whole raft of free independent institutions. The church, um, the media, um, even economics, but the schools, uh, and then a whole host of small volunteer organizations, university, for example. 
And all of those voluntary associations are intermediate centers of power. They provide a check on government power and preserve our freedom. I think another part of my political, political philosophy is that I favor private ownership and a market economy. I think the history of the 20th century has demonstrated that when the state owns all the means of production, then you combine political power and economic power, and the result is totalitarianism and injustice. Furthermore, it doesn't work very well. There was actually um, uh, an agency in Moscow that tried to set 25 million prices every year and determine how many products in each of those areas would be produced. There's nobody and no set of people that knows enough to do that. Supply and demand in a market economy simply works more efficiently. But it's also crucial to say that when you get huge privately owned corporations, then they become centers of enormous economic power. And furthermore, if they own the media that uh, largely shapes the politics, then you've got another dangerous centra centralization of power. About halfway through the 2016 elections, 150 families had made, had given one half of all the money to all the political candidates. That's dangerous centralization of power. Well, there are a lot of other um, parts of my uh, political philosophy. Religious freedom is certainly an important one. Uh, the priority of the poor I've already pointed to. Uh, Peacemaking is a, another part uh, of what I'm deeply committed to. And uh, finally, I'll mention what I call a consistent ethic of life. A long time ago, um, uh, it was in varsity press, as a matter of fact, published my book, Completely Pro-Life. Uh, and I pointed out there that I thought that uh, a commitment to the sanctity of human life didn't end at birth. It included economic justice uh, and, and so on. Now I do, uh, I am very concerned with abortion. Um, I'm opposed to abortion. I think we need to protect the sanctity of human life uh, of the unborn. I'm also opposed to euthanasia, but concern for the consistent ethic of life doesn't end with abortion and euthanasia. Tens of millions of people die unnecessarily every year because of starvation and malnutrition. Tobacco kills millions, racism kills millions, capital punishment kills human beings. I think we should respect the sanctity of human life from beginning to end. It's a seamless garment as Cardinal Bernadine, Bernadine the Catholic Cardinal of uh, Chicago used to say in the 1990s. Well, that's very quickly a, a summary of my book, uh, Just Politics. Let me now um, move to the present. I would want to say, first of all, that um, you know the various levels of the argument I previously presented uh, have different levels of, of um, assurance in my own thinking. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't claim that I've got it all right when I talk about a normal normative biblical framework. Uh, I would claim even less when I talk about my understanding of economics and politics and so on, uh, even less when I talk about my uh, political philosophy that comes from those two. Uh, but I'm doing my best and I act with uh, conviction and certainty to apply that. So I'm trying to do that even now uh, in 2020 in this amazing election year. In 2016, as you know, 81% uh, of white evangelicals uh, voted for Donald Trump. Overwhelmingly black evangelicals didn't, uh, only a minority of uh, Latino evangelicals voted for Trump. But 81% of white evangelicals did. And in fact, um, about 60%, 55 to 60, actually over 55, about 60% of white Catholics voted for Donald Trump. And about 60% of mainline Protestants voted for Donald Trump. I was just on a, a call today um, with a bunch of religious leaders, and we heard a report from Robert Jones. Some of you may know him. Uh, he actually grew up a Southern Baptist. He's now one of the most distinguished um, uh, pollsters on the connection between politics and religion uh, in this country. And he does an annual um, survey, and they just um, published that for this year. 
His organization is PRRI. And he pointed out that white evangelicals still, about 80%, uh, apparently are voting for Donald Trump. As you know, black evangelicals and Latino evangelicals are, are very different, but white Catholics and white mainline Protestants have also dropped significantly in their support of Donald Trump, somewhere around 50%, not the 60% in 2016. Now, let me be just straightforward and, and lay out uh, where I come out on all of this. The first thing I wanna say is I grieve, um, weep, not literally, but deep in my heart. I grieve over the division and nastiness of the way that Christians are talking to each other about politics uh, at this point in our history. I won't quote him, but a rather uh, prominent Christian pastor has, has said that the only evangelical who will vote for Joe Biden has, quote, sold his soul to the devil. Some people on the other side um, make some statements that uh, I certainly don't want to take, take. We need to recognize that we're one in Christ, even though we differ vigorously on concrete political decisions. Second thing I want to say is that between 1974 and 2016, as the uh, head of Evangelicals for Social Action, I regularly wrote on every pre presidential election, but I never endorsed a president. I didn't think that was my role. I tried to take my completely pro-life agenda and say on this set of issues, the one person is better on this set of issues, the other person is better, and I never endorsed anyone. I did in 2016, I wrote the Christianity Today article supporting, supporting Hillary Clinton, not because I thought she was absolutely wonderful, I disagreed with her on a number of things, but I thought that Donald Trump was simply unacceptable. And this year, um, I feel frankly, even more strongly about that. Uh, some of you may know that I uh, edited the book, The Spiritual Danger of Donald Trump, 30 Evangelical Christians on Justice, Truth, and Moral Integrity. The authors are from a variety of uh, viewpoints, um, Democrats, Independents, uh, Republicans, but we're all struggling as biblical Christians to try to talk about how Christians should vote this year. And then about uh, three weeks ago, I think we launched it on October the 2nd, um, I uh, led along with Richard Mao, the um, president emeritus of Fuller Seminary, a group called Pro-Life Evangelicals for Biden. We launched it, it's got a lot of attention. Um, and uh, one of the things that Rich Mao and I did was to do a short op-ed in the Christian Post. I don't know if you know the Christian Post. It's actually a very influential online magazine, um, 50 million views every month, and it's a very conservative magazine. Um, but they published our op-ed. And let me just share that with you as a way of concluding my initial comments. We say, Rich Mao and I, that the signers of this statement are diverse. A Trump voter in 2016, a lifelong Republican, who refused to vote for Trump or Clinton in 2016, never voted for a Democrat um, in his life. The, uh, the key signers are people like um, uh, Billy Graham's granddaughter, uh, Jerusha Duford, uh, uh, John Huffman, he was the Richard Nixon pastor for a time, and then board chair emeritus of Christianity Today, Richard Foster, imagine many of you read his book, Celebration of Discipline, Brenda Salter McNeil, InterVarsity um, uh, famous person, John Perkins, and a number of uh, former college, evangelical college and seminary presidents. Well, Rich Mao and I go on to say that we acknowledge as pro-life evangelicals that we disagree with Vice President Biden and the Democratic platform on the issue of abortion. But we believe our statement continues that a biblically shaped commitment to the sanctity of human life compels us to a consistent ethic of life that affirms the sanctity of human life from beginning to end. Our statement points out that many problems 
that better politics could correct violate the sanctity of human life. Poverty, lack of health care, racism, climate change all kill persons created in the image of God. They are also pro-life issues. We say in our statement, uh, Rich Mao and I, that poverty and diseases we know how to prevent, kill millions every year. But Donald Trump has regularly proposed cutting U.S. foreign aid to save millions of lives in poor countries. And he's repeatedly tried to cut anti-poverty programs in the U.S. Poverty is a pro-life issue. Lack of health care kills people. Studies have shown that people without health insurance are less likely to visit a doctor, are more likely to have poor health, and they die younger than persons with health insurance. The Affordable Care Act provided health insurance to an additional 20 million Americans and pro prohibited insurance companies from refusing to cover persons with pre-existing conditions. Donald Trump has repeatedly tried to abolish the Affordable Care Act. He's not offered any genuine alternative. Health care is a pro-life issue. Racism kills. We know that racism killed American, African Americans in slavery by the thousands and thousands and thousands. And later, thousands of people were killed, African Americans, by white people in lynchings. But even today, African Americans are several times more likely than white Americans to be killed by the police. And the death rate for African Americans because of COVID-19 is 3.6 times that of white Americans. Unfortunately, Donald Trump refuses to condemn racist groups, continues to stoke racism, rather than trying to unite the country to struggle against racism. Racism is a pro-life issue, and it's on the ballot in 2020 in a way that has seldom been on the ballot since the 1960s. Climate change already kills thousands of people, untold, untold thousands, it will kill tens of millions unless we soon make important changes. The scientific consensus is overwhelming. We must reduce greenhouse gases and we do it, do it quickly. And the poor, of course, will suffer the most. But Donald Trump denies the near scientific consensus on climate change. He's made a whole host of policies that make things much worse in terms of climate change. Climate change is a pro-life issue. Rich Mao and I make clear at the end of our op-ed that we mourn and are committed to work to reduce the number of abortions. But we note three things. First of all, even if Donald Trump were to win in November the 3rd, and if the Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade, that may be in place already because of his third um, Senate appointment, I mean, a, ju a judicial appointment, we don't know about that. But as a matter of fact, even if that happens, not a great deal will change. Gallup poll after Gallup poll shows that about 75% of all Americans want abortion to be legal. Although fortunately, about 50% at least want some restrictions. I'm glad of that. But 75% insist that it should be legal. So when this decision goes back to the individual states, if it does, the right to uh, laws, on the, the, the right to write laws on abortion will happen at the state level. And in most places, abortion will be legal under significant circumstances. Second, with regard to abortion, the most common reason that women give for abortions is the financial difficulty of having another child. Now, knowing that, we appreciate the fact that there are a number of democratic proposals which would significantly alleviate that financial burden. For example, accessible health services for everyone, health insurance, affordable child care, a minimum wage that lifts workers out of poverty so a mother will be able to have a decent income and care for that child. And third, as I've already suggested, not just abortion, but poverty, lack of health coverage, racism, climate change are also pro life issues. Our statement notes that the official public policy document of the National Association of Evangelicals for the Health of the Nation, and the NAE is the largest evangelical network in the country, their official document says, and I quote, faithful 
evangelical civic engagement and witness must have a biblically balanced agenda. And therefore, we conclude the new pro-life evangelicals for Biden document says that, quote, we must oppose one issue political thinking because it lacks a biblical balance. And we conclude, for these reasons, we believe that on balance, Joe Biden's policies are more consistent with the biblically balanced shaped ethic than those of Donald Trump. And therefore, as we continue to urge different policies on abortion, we urge evangelicals to elect Joe Biden as president. You can see that statement at www.prolifeevangelicalsforbiden.com. And now let's um, talk together. What are your questions, comments? Uh, I look forward to that. And maybe you're gonna do the breakout groups first and then the conversation, but I hope we can have some dialogue at some point. But that's what I wanted to share by way of getting the conversation started, my friends. Thanks a lot. Um, definitely a lot to chew on. Um, so just to orient, orient you guys, um, we will have a Q&A now, um, but for the sake of the recording, I will uh, sort of facilitate that. So if you have questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, and we, then we will go into breakout rooms. And then if you want to save your question to ask verbally, feel free, we will give a chance to do that after the breakout discussions. So you can save it for that time if you'd like. So um, in the meantime, if you'd like to get questions in, um, go ahead and add them to the chat. Um, I, can, I will just say that uh, I love conversation. Uh, people have disagreed with me the pa in the past. It doesn't destroy me. I enjoy it. So uh, feel free. Awesome. Yeah. So feel free to put it in the chat or speak up. Um, to get us started while people are sort of thinking and or typing, I can I can provide a question to that um, someone actually sent in. Um, so you kind of talked about how uh, Christians have should have this normative framework and that often they it, it should look different from the sub Christian uh, frameworks that like the Democrats and Republicans have uh, subscribe to. Um, but in terms of more on the actionable advocacy side, can you maybe speak on how that could look different as a Christian versus if you were to take on the uh, subhuman or not subhuman, the sub-Christian? Yeah. yeah, well, for starters, it seems to me um, uh, Christian political advocacy ought to be honest, truthful, based in the facts, the science and the economics. Uh, and respectful of opponents. One of the things that's so tragic about the current political setting is that we've got deadlock because our representatives in Washington uh, uh, seldom listen to each other the way they used to. Uh, they're unable to negotiate. Um, they're such um, nasty, violent attacks on each other and it, and it works both ways. Uh, although I think um, our current president is uh, a leader <laughs> in all of that. Um, and so it makes it difficult to really accomplish things politically. If Christians are involved in politics, surely we would at least set a different model. Uh, we would be honest, truthful, respectful of people who disagree with us. We'd really listen um, to other people. And one of the things that makes me weep is that Christians seem to be in the current scene, uh, no better than anybody else on this. We have a question from Nancy that says, I feel as though there's a bias towards assuming that conservatives are anti-poor and progressives are pro-poor. However, I think that there are different policy situations to achieving the same outcome, um, such as a GOP tends to favor market-based solutions, whereas Democrats favor direct government intervention. What do you think about this? Yeah, well, I think that's a great uh, uh, question. And uh, I've actually voted, voted both, both ways. I voted for George W. Bush uh, in 2000 and 2004. Uh, and I did it uh, in 2000, especially primarily because um, I longed for a Republican who would say, I really care about the poor. Um, Justice for the poor matters, but those Democrats don't know how to do it. Um, and it's excessive uh, government uh, activity. Um, and I'd hope that he would do that. Now, I think that was a genuine part of what he cared about, but in fact, he did a huge tax cut, which largely benefited the richest 20%. Um, 
um, and um, uh, you know other things that uh, I don't think were wise in terms of uh, justice for the poor. But 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 here's basically what I want to say. I'm not. I start with a commitment to a market economy um, as the right economic framework. I don't want the government to own the bulk of the means of production. I don't want government to set uh, most of the prices. But I do think uh, there's solid biblical justification for government doing some kinds of things that empower poor people. Um, if government didn't pay for education, for example, then the wealthy could, could afford excellent schools and the poor could hardly have education at all. I think it's right for the government to tax all of us and it ought to provide quality education for everybody. Now, in fact, it doesn't. The, quality, the education it provides for inner city um, African-American Latinos is vastly inferior uh, to the quality education that government provides to white suburbs, uh, but it's appropriate for government uh, to do that. Um, I think um, it's appropriate for government to say that we must have health insurance uh, for everybody. Uh, now, I agree with Biden uh, that uh, we shouldn't abolish the private health insurance that's there. Uh, we should let that in place, but we ought to offer a government alternative uh, for people who can't uh, afford that uh, and get that so that everybody has um, health insurance or take a, a different area. Um, you can't deal with environmental issues that affect everybody uh, except um, well, you can encourage everybody to, uh, um, you know, turn down the heat and drive a Prius and so on, but um, uh, that's not going to solve the problem. Uh, Billy Graham, I think it was, it said a long time ago, if, you know, if um, something to the effect that uh, if uh, one um, corporation upstream uh, dumps uh, pollution in the river uh, and a, a competitor uh, decides to pay more and not dump the pollution in, then obviously, uh, he didn't say all of this, but uh, it, it was this kind of concern, then the person who pollutes uh, is going to make a short-term profit. You have to have laws for everyone. And the same thing is true in terms of, uh, of climate change. We have to have laws that um, have our cars get much greater efficiency. Uh, I think a carbon tax would be the way to go. Um, that is government activity. Uh, but then it lets the market uh, apply uh, that mechanism. So I'm concerned about uh, uh, the relationship between the government and, and the economy. I think you have to ask in each instance whether or not this particular government intervention will be too much government activity or too little, and also whether or not um, private individuals and private corporations can more easily and more effectively or simply can't effectively deal with a specific problem. 